pop 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 My name is Ross Gay, and I'm going to read this poem by Toy Derricotte called The Undertaker's Daughter. Terrified at a reading to read poems about my fears and shames, a voice in me said, just open your mouth. Now I read about Anubis, the god of Egypt, who ushered the dead to the underworld, who performed the ritual of the opening of the mouth so they could see, hear, and eat. Had it been my father speaking, giving me back that depth of taste and color, fineness of sound that his rages stifled, twisted and singed shut, I had thought it was a woman's voice, though I had hoped all my life that my father would feed me the milk my mother could not make from her body. Once, when I opened the door and saw him shaving, naked, the sole of his foot resting on the toilet, I thought those things hanging down were udders. From then on, I understood there was a female part he hid, something soft and unprotected I shouldn't see. Yeah, I love this poem for a lot of a lot of reasons and every time I read it I love it it's, it's occurring to me that I love it for more readings but one of the things that <clears throat> it's a poem about it's a poem about being afraid to read being afraid to share and a poem about being afraid to have a voice in the world and the thing that she start, it seems that she starts to get to is that there's that voice that she hears and she thinks it might be her father's voice, but her father's voice gets sort of converted in the course of the poem into the voice of a woman. There's something very feminine about that father's voice when she goes to that image of him naked and thinking that he's he has udders. That sort of conversion, you know, reading reading the rest of the poems in this book, we know that the, she had a very difficult relationship with her father, an abusive, an abusive father. But to sort of bring him back into the poem and to bring him back into her imagination as this person who had a kind of softness that she wants, that she needs to hear in order to make her poems. Um, there's something profoundly forgiving about that. Um, it's a kind of conversion of shame into um, love. That's what it is. Um, and I'm going to read a poem by me called Opera Singer. <clears throat> Today, my heart is so goddamn fat with grief that I've begun hauling it in a wheelbarrow. No, it's an anvil dragging from my neck as I swim through choppy waters swollen with the putrid corpses of hippos, which means lurking somewhere below is the hungry snout of a croc waiting to spin me into an oblivion worse than this run on simile, which means only to say, I'm sad, and everyone knows what that means. And in my sadness, I'll walk to a cafe and not see light in the trees or finger the bills in my pocket as I pass the boarded houses on the block no, I will be slogging through the obscure country of my sadness and all its monotone flourish. And so imagine my surprise when my self-absorption gets usurped by the sound of opera streaming from an open window. And the sun peeks ever so slightly from behind his shawl, and the singing is getting closer so that I can hear the delicately rolled R's like a hummingbird fluttering the tongue, which means a language more beautiful than my own. And I don't recognize the song, though I'm jogging toward it and can hear the woman's breathing through the record's imperfections. And above me, two bluebirds dive and dart and a rogue mulberry branch leaning over an abandoned lot drags itself across my face, staining it purple and looking now like a mad warrior of glee and relief 
I run down the street, and I forgot to mention the 50 or so kids running behind me, some in diapers, some barefoot, all of them winged and waving their pacifiers and training wheels and nearly trampling me when in a doorway I see a woman in slippers and a floral house dress blowing in the warm breeze who is maybe 70, painting the doorway, and friends, it is not too much to say it was heaven sailing from her mouth and all the fish in the sea, and giraffe saunter, and sugar in my tea, and the forgotten angles of love, and every name of the unborn and dead from this abuelita only glancing at me before turning back to her earnest work of brushstroke and lullaby, and because we all know the tongue's clumsy thudding makes of miracles, anecdotes, let me stop here and tell you I said thank you. When did you realize you had to be a poet? Um, you know, I don't feel like I have to be a poet. I feel like I love being a poet. I love writing poems. I love reading poems. I love um, all of the sort of opportunity it gives me to, you know, probe my questions in, in, in very specific ways and to immerse myself in language and to do all this kind of just wonderful, fun stuff. But um, there are other beautiful things that I love to do, and I can do those things um, too. Um, I feel like being in the garden um, does a lot for me that, that writing poems does. I feel like knowing my neighbors and being in a community with people um, does, does the work that I do in a lot of ways in being a poet and writing poems. So I don't have to be a poet. I love being a poet. Pop.